Hey, OpenJS world. My name is Linda Nichols, and today I'm going to talk about writing great code even in the cloud. So I'm going to start out by going through some slides and kind of talking about maybe some bad process, some good process, and then having a little hands-on demo at the end. So let's get started. So again, this is me, Linda Nichols. I work for Microsoft. I am a cloud native global black belt, and um, I would like to focus really in serverless and um, development and um, really like developer process is something I'm really passionate about. I'm from Virginia and I live in Norfolk, Virginia, where I organize a couple developer events. Um, Norfolk JS is our JavaScript user group and Revolution Conf is our very own conference here in Virginia Beach. Um, and um, I am a co-founder and organizer of both of these. So um, the first thing that you have to start with anytime you're talking about code that's in the cloud or um, you know, serverless um, functions as a service, no matter what cloud platform you're talking about, you always have to have this what is a serverless slide. And I like to, to acknowledge when I do this that serverless is completely made up. It's just like a really catchy marketing term, kind of like cloud. But when we talk about serverless, what do we mean? So serverless really means fully managed services, um, event-driven architectures, um, different um, internal and external triggers um, that then execute perhaps functions as a service that um, is part of a greater event-driven architecture. But also serverless tends to be very inexpensive. Um, so it's very, cheap essentially because you're only paying for what you use you don't have servers sitting out there forever idle holding your code that you pay for if you have thousands of apis you're only paying when those apis are actually executed also serverless um, is a focus on applications so it's more about your code making it to the cloud that code being executed and not so much about what's happening behind the scenes which is why we get to serverless which is essentially you know, just fewer servers and, you know, not really no servers. And it's essentially fewer wasted resources because, like I said, you don't have servers just sitting out there idle. So serverless is for developers because we as developers don't really want to have to worry about infrastructure in most cases. We really want to focus on development and our code and making our applications really, you know, be as streamlined and as fast as possible. So really also within serverless or just code that's executed within a cloud platform you have like so many services that are out there at your disposal and a lot of these services really replace instances where we might have written a lot of code before you know as javascript developers are kind of used to using something like happy or express for an http server um, I don't tend to use those anymore because I'm using something like API management and Azure, API Gateway and AWS, Apigee, you know, all kinds of various API management, you know, platforms and services instead of writing that code. And also there's not a lot of, you know, redundant code. Um, it's just naturally microservices or even like nano services because functions as a service tend to be so small. And it's a faster time to production because you're not worrying about that infrastructure. It's so easy to just deploy these functions, have your architecture ready to go. But there are actually servers. So this is a little joke, but you know, and apparently in Alaska, they're very concerned whether or not there are servers and serverless. So for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to talk about serverless. I'm going to talk about programming in the cloud, so to speak, in general. But but mainly, this is a talk about developers. We as developers, we as JavaScript developers, and you know how our behavior might be the same or different when we're now focused on pushing our code to the cloud. So we as JavaScript de developers, we have a lot of opinions. 
And we love process and best practices. If you know developers in general, or especially JavaScript developers, we love to discuss what's our what's our favorite everything and how to make everything you know faster and look better and be easier to use. So we really we like to use our favorite editor, our favorite languages, we our favorite formatting tools, we want our code to be a certain amount of pretty, we want static code analysis rules and formatting. No one will ever deny that they don't want these things. There'll be arguments about when to execute these tools or which tool to use, but there almost never is anyone saying, yeah, I don't want to do any of this. You know, unless you're talking about a situation where, you know, you're just trying to push code to production quickly. And, and in those cases, no one's arguing for that. It's just situations that sometimes happen. And so these are like some examples maybe of, of all the various things that we love and may discuss. And, you know, in, in this perfect world where we're executing everything um, the way that we want, um, you know, we're testing the code, we've written the code with all of our perfect tools that we love, we're testing the code, Oh wait, like we tested the code, but should we have written them before? Do we do TDD? Maybe not. That's another developer discussion. And then we commit the code. So now we commit the code to a revision control system. And maybe that system is local. Maybe it's on a server, you know, somewhere within your building. Maybe it's in the cloud, um, you know, and then now to get that code through development and testing and production, we've got various branching strategies. Um, do we squash commits we don't like? Do we um, not squash them? Do we want to, you know, do we want to rebase um, our commit messages? Is it okay to just, you know, looks good to me, here's my code, or do we need to include some sort of issue number, you know, for another um, system? You know, do the the branch names have to be some sort of specific format? These are all things that developers care about and we focus on. And again, all kinds of choices here. There's nothing that anybody has to know or shouldn't use. It's all just very opinionated and most products are just, you know, doing the job for us. You know, we're merging our code then into master, into production. Um, do we use pre-commit hooks? Um, do we push to a dev branch and then the dev branch goes to master? Do we have our individual dev branches? We issue a pull request. Once we issue a pull request, then what happens there? Um, our code analysis, does it happen in our editor? Does it happen in the cloud? You know, we ensure that if we've written all these unit tests, we want them to pass. Um, and then, you know, we request a code review because we're working on a team with other developers and we care about their opinions. Um, we, and sometimes these are their opinions, you know, and sometimes those reviewers can be tough, <laughs> but it's good because it makes us better to kind of understand what people within our team and external to our team might think about the code we just wrote. Okay, so looks good. The code is now merged. And QRCICD tool, again, another very opinionated list um, of tools. And there's all kinds of choices here of different tools that can, you know, run lots of smaller tools like code analysis and tests, et cetera. And, you know, what kind of CI you want to use, where you want it to run, where you want it to be hosted, again, all your choice, as long as you are choosing at least one. So now here's the topic of our talk, because we're going to talk about what about code that's written for the cloud? What about serverless code? What about code that's going to go to a function as a service, as opposed to maybe just application code that we're used to writing before where it gets packaged up and maybe containerized or something, and it's, you know, maybe used on-prem or it's used in, you know, maybe some other cloud service, but it's not quite functions as a service. So I'm going to show a pre-recorded demo of kind of what I have seen as far as developers who are new to the cloud pushing their code to production. And so this is our um, dramatic reenactment here. 
We've got our programmer. He's in the AWS console. Um, this is AWS Lambda. There's an editor. Um, the editor, you know, does have like a little bit of um, interesting features here as far as, um, you know, autocomplete and, you know, preventing bugs. But as you can tell, he made some choices there. He made some changes and then he pushed to production. So that seems a little dramatic. However, I have seen this happen before. Um, that editor is available. It looks like your IDE that you're used to, and there is a button to deploy there. But it's a little scary, right? Because what if we think back to all we know? We just went through all these tools that we love and we use and processes and linting and you know testing and where was all that? No unit tests were run, nothing was linted. Um, it just went to production. And, and then basically testing then happens in production. So let's kind of zoom in again and look at this code. Well, already we're seeing that there's some kind of bugs in this code. There's um, even this editor here is flagging some errors, but our developer is, is essentially ignoring those and hitting publish because we said it was fast to get code to production using serverless and he's going to do that. Yeah, but it doesn't make sense, right? Like, why would you push your code to production when we've talked about how developers have all these opinions? And unfortunately, no matter how fully managed a serverless or, or cloud service is, it's not fully managed enough to format and debug and test your messy code. Garbage in, garbage out. So, as developers, we hold these processes so close to our heart, and then we're willing to throw them away. And you may say, well, that's not me. I would never do that. But I've seen it a lot because, well, the cloud is new and it's a little scary. And you're given all these tools and it seems like a new way of doing things. And so it's easy to kind of forget that it's still development that you still wanna go through your software development life cycle. That the things we've been doing for years, the things we fight about on the internet, these tools that we disagree with, the reason they exist is because they're important. Because all of these checks and balances are, are how we create good software. And we can still capitalize on the fact that serverless or you know, cloud development platforms are fast production without sort of losing our soul. So I'm gonna talk about now how um, all of the development practices that we love still apply in this environment. That even though it's scary, even though it's weird, even though it's different, it's still the same. So you don't have to sacrifice all that you love. Like maybe some of the services that you love we will now get rid of because we don't need that code anymore. We don't need those frameworks. But as far as you know, running through, testing your code, making sure that it's quality, um, all of those things are super important. And I just always want to keep stressing that. So here's my very highly opinionated tool set. And in you know, anyone could could sort of say that that any of these tools they would prefer something else, and that's fine. But this is what I'm going to kind of um, demonstrate today. Um, so, first of all, ESLint. This is very important to me. I love ESLint. I have ESLint in my editor. I have, sometimes I'll use ESLint as a pre-commit hook. I always have it as some sort of like CI CD process, no matter what tool I'm using to run a linter, because I've seen code that wasn't linted make it into a code base. and. Sometimes it's just ugly. Sometimes it's just inconsistent, but Lint can also find errors. Um, so if you're not familiar with ESLint, essentially it is a list of rules that you define. And then, you know, if you have it, so it is automatic in your, brow, like in your, sorry, in your editor, then it will tell you as you're typing um, that you're going against one of the rules. And, I really also like ESLint as a team tool because you can create ESLint configurations for your team. If you all have the same highly 
opinionated opinion <laughs> or your manager has a certain opinion, then you can define that in the rules. And then you're not always kind of arguing amongst each other whether or not those braces need to be at the end of the line or the, or the next line. Um, and so there's also configurations out there that sort of bigger companies have made like Airbnb or Spotify um, or even the ESLint recommended um, that you can import and then you can kind of use their rules and then you can kind of overwrite the ones you don't agree with like as necessary. Editor config um, is a file that you can put in your code base that will also enforce style like tabs versus spaces for a code base. So if you have um, maybe like open source software that a lot of people are contributing to, this is really helpful so that when you're looking at the code later, the spacing it isn't really off. Um, Prettier is sort of similar. Um, Prettier just sort of builds upon ESLint and I tend to use this as um, a pre-commit hook um, because then it allows um, me to sort of code the way I'm comfortable coding um, but then Prettier runs right before I commit and it formats everything in the way that the code base wants, even if it's different from my de personal development style, because that's something you might not want to enforce as a team. You might not, if, if your developers can code faster using their methodology and then just have it automatically conform to what you you want as let's say a manager or a team lead before it's committed, then that makes things a lot easier. Um, for testing, I like Mocha. I've also used Jest. Um, there's lots of testing tools out there. Um, this is unit testing I'm, I'm talking about here more so. For CI, I like GitHub Actions. I also like Azure DevOps. Um, I've used Travis CI quite a bit also in the past. Um, and today I'm going to show GitHub Actions. And for an editor, I really like VS Code. Um, and off language, of course, JavaScript, Node.js. Um, and for cloud, well, I prefer Azure because I work for Microsoft. Um, but I have a little asterisk there because today I'm going to show in my CI CD process how I would deploy to both Azure and AWS Lambda, um, just as sort of proof that this is really kind of a cloud agnostic way of thinking. Even though some of my tools here with GitHub and VS Code seem to very, be very Microsoft specific, it's actually the idea of using a tool set to ensure that your code is bug free and looks really great and is going to cause you no issues in production. That's really a very agnostic idea. So now I'm going to go uh, switch over to my editor and I'm going to work on this demo. Essentially, it's an algorithm. Um, we'll put an asterisk there uh, to determine who is the best Ghostbuster. Perhaps you've noticed that theme throughout this talk. Um, there's my uh, GitHub repo there, um, no Dana, only Zool. And um, we're going to go through just some a very simple process. I mean, this is not production code by any means, but just demonstrating how if I'm developing services for a serverless system using a function as a service, whether it's Azure Functions or AWS Lambda, what does my development process look like? All right, so now I'm in VS Code and I want to talk about just a couple things now with um, my uh, workflows. So I have three workflows. One is pull request, and then I have two here that are essentially my production workflows. My pull request workflow, the idea for this is that this just runs my build, my unit tests, um, and it does some linting. And really, this uh, will just this runs on both of my services. So I have four services overall. Two are not implemented yet. I've implemented Spangler and Venkman, and this runs those two services. And essentially, what I want to do with this is I want to say when a user issues a pull request on my main branch, that the linting and the tests have to pass before that pull request can ever be pulled in. An admin can you know, do it if they want to, but at least that barrier is there that this, these initial checks have to have to run. Then also for each one of these services, Spangler is um, Azure Functions, it deploys to Azure Functions after it also runs some additional tests even, 
And then Vinkman deploys to AWS Lambda. If you're not familiar with GitHub Actions, um, this is sort of the format here, um, this YAML form format. And then at the top here, it will talk about um, the trigger. So here it's whenever you push anything to the main branch, it deploys. And then I have some checks that people can't push directly to main without first issuing a pull request. All right, um, now I want to look at my ESLint file. So these are the rules I have. My base configuration is the ESLint recommended. And then I override that a little bit and say, like, I want my intention to be four spaces. I want my quotes to be single, and I always want to have semicolons. And that's very opinionated here. And I also have my editor config file that indicates that I prefer spaces to tabs and, you know, automatically trimming the white space. That's really nice, too. Um, so let's go into one of my services here. Now, it might look like there's some really bad HTML in here, but just push the I believe button because this is a very complicated algorithm to determine the best Ghostbuster. So you can see here in my editor that if I remove the semicolon, I immediately get an indicator there. So I know what I have done. <laughs> so let's, he let's say, let's make a couple little changes. So that was in Spangler. Now let's go to Vinkman, which is very similar. Okay, now I'm down in my terminal here. I have modified two files. You might notice too that I am on a different branch that's called OpenJS World. This is my development branch and it's a branch off of main. Oh, I don't wanna send it to main. I want to send it to OpenJS World. If I tried to send it to main, it would be very confused that it's on the wrong branch. So that's just a nice little check of using Git here. So now my code has been pushed. Let's go back to GitHub. So now GitHub, uh, this is my GitHub repo. GitHub has seen that I've now pushed to this branch. So now I'm gonna do a pull request. Um, and I'm gonna say this message is okay. I would normally leave some better comments. I don't care at the moment. I could set some reviewers. Um, on my team, um, and I'm not gonna worry about that either, but and then also some labels. But for the sake of time, we're just gonna open a pull request. And now we're gonna see here that it's running these two checks, essentially, that is running my lint, my unit test, um, all of this sort of, um, you know, static code analysis here to make sure that this pull request really makes sense. Um, to pull into the code base. While those are running, I can also go here and look at all of my workflows. Not just passed, I had two jobs. And then I can see what happened inside of each job. So if something fails, I can go in here um, and look and see what happened with my unit tests. I have some very, very simple unit tests that are meant for passing currently. <laughs> okay, so my pull request is now ready to, to be pulled in. So I'm gonna pull it in and it's automatically going to deploy um, my brand new algorithms for finding the um, best Ghostbuster. Um, there's a couple settings that I have here. Um, I have a setting so that um, it's a actually a setting on the main branch 
that allows uh, pull requests to not be pulled into Maine unless they pass those um, certain CI checks. That's an, an option within this repo. Also, um, I automatically delete branches after I pull in a pull request. So it's just a little bit of housekeeping that I prefer. So now we'll go up to our actions um, and they're both working on um, deploying. All right, so this one has already kind of gone through the environment. Now, so right now I'm sort of, you know, banking everything on um, node 14. I mean, you can also specify other versions of Node and you can run through all of them. Um, there's there's similar capabilities in Azure DevOps and Travis CI and Jenkins and other tools. Um, but I like the way the matrix works here where it just runs them all as separate jobs. Um, and here's my Lambda deploy option and then my post checkout. So it looks like that is still running here. Okay, and it looks like this one has now passed also. Great, one job completed. Okay, and you can see here, it gives me this deployment address. Okay, so now we can look at our algorithms. So you'll notice this URL matches this URL, which has determined that the, I'm going to refresh because this is old. Okay, great. It received my change and it still believes that the best Ghostbuster is Spangler. Thank you, Giphy, for our GIF. <laughs> now, this is the Azure Functions um, service. Now, let's go to the AWS Lambda service. I'm going to refresh so we receive our latest change for OpenJS world and AWS prefers Venkman and says that Venkman is in fact the best Ghostbuster. But, you know, like a lot of developer opinions, there's also a lot of opinions about who the best Ghostbuster is. So, in conclusion, um, just a couple of things that I want to drive home here. No ops, as in not worrying about infrastructure, worrying more about code doesn't mean no DevOps. That doesn't mean that you don't think about your development process. You don't think about how you move through your stages. It doesn't mean no DevOps, no CI, CD tool. All those things still apply. All those things you still care about. Almost everything you cared about before as far as process still exists. Um, online editors are a lot better than they have been in the past and they're getting better and better, but it's not the same as a true revision control system, whether that's GitHub that I prefer or SVN or, or whatever. Um, it's just not the same. And even saving revisions of software in the cloud isn't quite the same as a robust revision control tool. So love your linter. I love my linter. You should always love your linter. Even if you have to run it multiple times at multiple stages, it's really important. It will save you from making bugs. Um, there's a rule for you know not allowing um, variables that aren't being used. That has saved me so many times from times where I've just misspelled something. Um, put your editor to work. Make your editor do the formatting. Make your editor run prettier. Make your editor do the linting. Um, and that really saves you a lot of work and it saves a lot of failures once your code makes it into the cloud. Um, testing in prod is not testing. Um, we saw our YOLO developer video where our developer wrote some code and then pushed it to production. And then of course that code was going to fail and then tested it. That's not actual testing. We need unit tests, we need integration tests, we need load tests, um, and it, it's all important. I didn't go through all the testing options here. In fact, on in this particular algorithm, the testing is light, but it's to give you the idea. Um, abstraction is not CI, CD. 
once you abstract away um, all of the infrastructure concerns, it's not the same as having a true CI/CD system where your code is pushed through many layers. Um, if you're writing code in the cloud, you're not just going to have necessarily one subscription or resource group or however um, your services are um, kind of logically organized within your cloud, you're not just going to have one that's production. You're going to have development, testing, production, different layers and different ways to move your co code across those platforms so it can be properly tested. You don't have bugs in production. And like most importantly, don't abandon what's important. If you have, if you're doing something, if you're if you're writing code, no matter where you're writing it, if you feel a little dirty, if you feel bad, if it's scary, then think about it. Okay, why did I lose that process? Why did I think it was okay to push directly to production? Why did I think it was okay to not really check through my code? Why did I expect things to magically become better once they went to the cloud? And thank you. Thanks for coming to my talk. And um, I hope that you will continue to hold what's dear and fight for all the tools that are important to you on the internet. Thanks.